So by 1920, Henry Ford is, if not the most successful individual industrial magnate in the world, he's certainly the most iconic one. He's revolutionized production processes with a full implementation of the assembly line concept. He's, cre he's created something that historians call welfare capitalism by giving what is at that time an unheard of daily wage of $5 a day to his workers with the idea of keeping them content, uh, of keeping them working for Ford rather than moving somewhere else. And he's in the process of building a massive new integrated industrial facility just outside of Detroit, the River Rouge plant, which is completed in 1928. At that point, it's the biggest factory in the world, and it's still in operation today, making Ford F-150s. So Ford is incredibly successful. He's making huge amounts of money, more money than he could have ever dreamed of as a Michigan farm boy. So what does he decide to do with all of that fame and wealth and power? Well, people decide to do all kinds of different things when they achieve that kind of status. Bill Gates decides he wants to solve the problem of malaria. Howard Hughes decides he wants to hide in hotel penthouses for the rest of his life. But what Ford decides to do is to tell everybody how wrong they are about everything and how right he is. Ford buys a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. And he starts to use this to put out his own version uh, of what the world is and what it should look like, his own philosophy. Now, parts of this philosophy are going to sound very familiar to you. Uh, they're going to sound very familiar because many of them are later picked by others who are convinced, picked up by others who are convinced that their own success, their own wealth has made them uh, authorities on just about everything. You know, Ford, of course, uh, is, is perhaps not popular with historians because he famously said, history is bunk, history is nonsense. But he also thought a lot of other things were nonsense as well. Government interventions in the economy, those were nonsense. Government attempts to try to reduce the level of poverty uh, by increasing regulation of corporations or others, those were also nonsense. They simply made things worse. Ford promotes this vision through the Dearborn Independent it's not only circulated in Michigan, it is available for free at every Ford dealership in the world. Oh, uh, one more thing that, that Ford also thinks. Ford thinks that the Jews control everything. He thought that Jews were responsible for corruption in sports, corruption in politics, corruption in the media. And he became incredibly powerful, uh, or, or rather popular, among some people because of his anti-Semitism. People like, for instance, Adolf Hitler. Uh, who kept Ford's uh, photo uh, on, his, uh, on his desk and distributed some of his publications. But Ford isn't so successful at convincing his workers that his point of view is the one that they should adopt. And because he's not successful, he decides that where persuasion won't work, force and coercion is the way he's going to have to go. He creates something in his company called the Social Department. And the social department conducts surveillance on Ford's workers, on his employees, when they're not actually on the job. They study the workers to find out who's a drinker, who's a gambler, uh, who is not paying child support. And there are punishments for them on the job, wage cuts uh, or even getting fired for that kind of behavior. And Ford is especially concerned to prevent union activity among his workers. A sort of auxiliary to the social department which is mostly composed of people like former professors and so on, uh, is another group which is mostly composed of former boxers. And the former boxers find out who is talking about unionizing at Ford plants. And they meet them, and this happens pretty consistently, they meet them at the end of the day and they beat them up. Not surprisingly, this puts a real damper on union activity in Ford plants.